So this is part two in our verse-by-verse verse study of the Gospel of Mark. We're going to go all the way through the entire Gospel. We're actually going to be in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 today. That's the section we're going to be covering. At least that's the plan, and I think I can stick to it. Some days I'm not so sure, but today I think I can stick to it. So we're looking, just to remind you guys, we're looking at contextual or historical insights. We're looking at theological insights. We're looking at a real biblical application into our lives. We just want to, like legitimate application of what we're reading and not something we sort of force to find a reason to apply it, you know? And then number four, we're looking for apologetic related issues that come up in the text. And I think we'll have some of all of that today um, as we go through. So here's, here's what we're looking at. We're looking at John the Baptist. That's how Mark's gospel starts. Mark's gospel starts with John the Baptist, and he is the forefront person. In fact, you'll see him in all of the gospels as a prominent person in each of them. And I wonder if you've ever considered what's up with John the Baptist. Like, why? Why not just have Jesus? Why is John the Baptist there? And it's actually profoundly important that his presence is there. So we're going to go through it three times, Mark 1 through 8. Three times tonight. First time, I'm just going to read it. Because the reading of the scripture is something that we maybe sometimes neglect, especially in our study of scriptures. So then we're talking about a verse and we don't have it in context in our brain. So we're just going to read through it. Um, then second time, we're going to go through the main points of the passage. Because sometimes when you're talking about little details, you're like, I'm just lost. You know, where's the main point? Then I'm going to go back over it again with just an analysis of some specific things that I would consider as side points that I think are just neat. They're just fun stuff to talk about, but I felt like it would distract us if I put it in the main body of the message. You'll understand as we go. So as we read it through right now, just take it in. Ask yourself as we're reading Mark 1, 1 through 8, why does Mark's gospel start this way? That's the question you're going to ask. Why does it start this way? Just notice what it says. So Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Again, we're using today the NASB version. Um, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he, and he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so just kind of soaking that in, right? Just kind of taking it all in in context. Now we're going to go over it. Here's our second time, looking at the main issues of Mark 1, 1 through 8. So Mark 1, verse 1. In the beginning, uh, excuse me, in the beginning. I went to Genesis or John. I don't know which one. It just says, the beginning. So the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel. This is the beginning of the good news. We know gospel means good news, right? It's the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, but the first thing I notice is it does not begin with Jesus on the cross. It doesn't begin with Jesus on the cross, right? That's, in, that's essential. That's part of the good news of Jesus. It doesn't even begin with Jesus' birth, although, although we will get that in Luke and in Matthew. We will get discussions about Jesus' birth and genealogy. Those are part of the good news, but what does Mark begin with? What does Mark begin with? Well, verse 2 gives us what he begins with. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. So Mark begins the gospel of Jesus with this one who's preparing the way. Who's the one preparing the way? John the Baptist, right? It seems really clear as we just read straight through, and most of you already knew this, right? It's, just, it's obviously John the Baptist. That's very obvious in the passage. I don't need to do a lot of work to, t to tell you that. But who is he preparing the way for? That's the next question I'll ask in verses 2 and 3. He's preparing the way for who? And you could say Jesus. That would be accurate. But what does it say there in verse 3? Make ready the way of the Lord. And if we look up the passage itself in the Old Testament, it is Yahweh. He's preparing the way of 
Yahweh, and as you read the passages in context that are being quoted here in Mark, which I'll talk more about a little bit later, as you read them in context, you'll see that it is, it is not only like the Messiah that will show up. It is Yahweh who is showing up and coming to his temple. That's the ways being prepared by John the Baptist for God to arrive in Israel. That's the Old Testament context. That's exciting to me. This is a strike against those who think that the deity of Jesus is not taught in Mark. You will hear this online, as you'll hear lots of things online, uh, especially about Jesus and the, and the Bible and Christianity. <laughs> hear lots of stuff. But the truth is that here in the first three verses, we have three indications of the deity of Christ. We have one thing, the, that it's Yahweh who's coming. He's the one whose way is being prepared. We also have the title Son of God and the title Messiah. And when we study those in depth in the Old Testament, we will see that this person is ultimately, well, Old and New Testament, we'll see this person is ultimately going to be God with us. The Son of God, if, if we read, uh, for instance, Hebrews chapter 1, God has spoken to us in these last times through his Son. And then it describes him in deity terms. Uh, Colossians, it tells us that he is God. So this, this Son of God character and this Messiah character, um, he is ultimately the Lord. So whole studies can be done on that, and um, they should be done on that, but that's not the focus of today. I just want to main point, throw it in there. Yeah, we have the deity of Jesus here in the very beginning of Mark. Um, so you might say Mark begins with John announcing Jesus. That could be your conclusion. Mark begins with John announcing Jesus. But actually, he began way before that, didn't he? He was the beginning of the gospel, and then he quotes Old Testament passages written hundreds of years before Jesus shows up. That's significant. He's like, the gospel begins with the Old Testament. That's the beginning of the gospel. That's pretty cool. I like this. Um, so it seems to begin with an old, the Old Testament announcing that John would announce Jesus and that Jesus would be Yahweh. That's interesting. Really interesting. More than interesting. So, um, quick note, John is the herald preparing the way for Jesus, who is Yahweh, but he himself, John, is also heralded by prophecy just as Jesus is. So in this we see a, a proof of the legitimacy of John and Jesus because of the Old Testament prophecy proclaiming that he was coming. Prophecy is a key thing in the case for the truth of the Bible and the truth of Christianity. Jesus himself makes it key in even teaching others how to prove that he is who he says he is. He's like, it was written. That's like a huge deal, so we should be noticing these things when we see them in the passages. Um, as we read on, we're going to go to verse 4 now. As we read on, ask yourself, seeing that people needed to be prepared to receive Jesus, what prepares them? That's the next question I want you to ask because we're kind of plowing through. So here's verse 4. What, what prepares people for receiving Jesus, for his arrival? Verse 4, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of of sins, and all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. How are they being prepared? They're being told to repent. So the preparation for Jesus is repent. This is just old time gospel preaching stuff right here. This is that stuff that people don't want to hear. If this is elements of the gospel here that people want to take out of the gospel, and they're very somewhat embarrassed about it. And I understand why they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed because the world doesn't like it. Which is why we have to tell the world to repent. Because you don't like things that are true. You're not doing things that are right. So repent, he says. Repent. That, that's how they'll be prepared. And baptism, it clearly represents the washing of sins. That's John's baptism, what was it about? It was about washing your sins away. You come and repent, your sins are washed. That, that was the idea but behind his baptism. Um, this baptism, in other words, we're saying with John and his, his whole message is to receive Jesus, you need a repentant attitude towards sin. A repentant attitude towards sin. And I think that in some ways our attitude towards sin it reveals that we have a certain attitude towards God, right? Like if you take a coin, there's like a heads and tails side of a coin. And if I focus the head towards you, then the tails are, is focused towards me. Which side of you is focused towards sin? The other side is pointing at God. That's the idea. I'm either, Lord, I'm, I'm embracing sin, in, in which case I'm rejecting you, or I'm turning from sin, in which case I'm turning to you. It's just an automatic thing. It's antithetical to God, and his character is sin. And so, um, so this idea of repentance, um, in other words, your attitude towards sin, it reflects your attitude towards God ultimately. And this is why 
Um, repentance is not just saying, oh, don't do that, it's bad. It's also saying that it's a personal wound in your relationship with God. Because your attitude towards sin, it's telling you something about your attitude towards God, right? If, if, if a, a, a person was to cheat on their spouse, they have an attitude towards the person they're cheating with. But that is also an attitude towards their spouse, isn't it? It is personal. And so there is like a personal connection that's going on there. So the application I'll have, simplistically, as I'm kind of moving quickly through just main points in Mark right now, the application is this. You cannot take repent out of the gospel. That word repent is a beautiful word. It's a biblical word, and it's on the lips of Jesus. It's on the lips of John. It's on the lips of the apostles. It's on the lips of the prophets, and it should be on our lips as well. It doesn't mean we have to be jerks about it, right? But they'll probably think you're being a jerk, whether you are or not, because it's the nature of of how people respond if they're unrepentant and you're telling them they need to repent. We can't have, for instance, this weird version of the gospel which never gets explained in detail, but it's basically forgiveness, but we also imply that they never have any sin anyways. So God loves you. He's ready to forgive you at any moment. So you're saying they need to repent? Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. No, no, no. You've just, we all make mistakes. But the irony is thinking about it this way. is like if, if God doesn't need to for you know, if you haven't, got sin issues, you don't need to repent, then forgiveness doesn't even mean anything. Right? If I go, Randy, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you, Randy. You're just smiling at me because you're like, I didn't do anything to you, Mike. There's nothing to forgive, you know? And if I start pushing it and be like, Randy, you need to repent and I'll forgive you. Now you'll be like uh, insulted unless you realize there's an actual sin issue. But some people will go and preach forgiveness but not mention sin or not mention why you're being forgiven. And it's just this embarrassment, I think, about the element of the gospel that people find offensive. And so we're not willing to give the whole picture. You know, I'm, I, I used to hear growing up too from even family members and stuff, like, I just don't like that fire and brimstone preaching. And I always thought, I always thought like, man, I was reading the Bible and there was these words I found. Fire and brimstone. So I started to try to think, like, what is it that they don't like? And I think that people don't like feeling uncomfortable. I think I just don't want to feel uncomfortable. And for this, I go, as I read the New Testament, as I read the, the Gospels, as I read the book of Acts, I'm like, it looks to me like following Jesus means feeling uncomfortable in a lot of social situations. Um, you can lovingly call people towards repentance, and they can hate you for it. That's, a, that's an entirely possible result of preaching the gospel. But we can't take the term repent and out of Christianity as though it doesn't apply. Just believe in Jesus and repentance will somehow just like take care of itself. Well, it could, but it will do so in spite of my bad preaching. right? I'm, I should be teaching the whole thing that God is teaching, the whole message. And John goes out and he tells him to repent. Um, but... Um, our job then is to do the same, but not to add offense. I don't want to add to the already offensive nature of elements of the gospel. I don't want to add me being a jerk to that, like I'm angry at people, like I'm not beckoning them to come. Like I don't see repent as a beautiful word that's an invitation and a promise of forgiveness. And it is a beautiful thing. I want to communicate it that way. So there's something, though, about John that if you think about it in the Jewish mindset, about what John's doing, think about this Jewish mindset. You have like the temple and you got the priests and you got the sacrifices and you have the whole Levitical system going on, right? And there's this guy out in the wilderness. He's nowhere near Jerusalem. He's out in the wilderness and he's calling you to come out. And he goes, yes, repent, repent, and you'll be forgiven and you'll just be baptized. Get baptized, repent, and you'll be forgiven. What's missing from this forgiveness from a Jewish mindset? Sacrifice. sacrifice. It's like there's no sacrifice. Like, isn't this weird? Wait how, wait, how is this working, John? Like, there's, like, specific instructions for sins and how the sacrifices are to take place. There's no sacrifice for this. And I think it may have raised eyebrows in John's time. John, we recognize that what you're doing seems legit. You seem like a real prophet of God, but people are just getting baptized. They're not, they're not doing anything sacrificially. Where's the offering, John? Well, we don't hear about that until John chapter 1 where one day Jesus shows up and John sees Jesus. And now think about the mindset of a Jew seeing John's ministry. And John looks to Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The implication is that this free forgiveness and washing that John has been preaching is going to be purchased by the sacrifice of this man, Jesus. That's neat. 
<laughs> I think that's really neat. So I think what John's doing is he's preaching this free forgiveness, and there's someone who will come in the future, and you don't have all the details yet. And that's kind of an example of sort of like a pre-Christ faith. They have real faith in, the, in Christ and what's revealed, but they don't have the whole story yet. And um, later on, we find there were some who didn't believe in Jesus having not been baptized by John, um, meaning that their response to John ended up relating to the response to Jesus. So in the same way Jesus says, like, hey, if you respond to Moses, if you believe Moses, you would have believed me. That the response to God's lesser re revelations in the belief or disbelief of those things, uh, it means you also respond in the same way to Jesus when you do hear about him. And so even those who haven't heard the gospel, when they do hear it and they reject, they were already rejecting something from God initially. That's the implication. Interesting there. Um, okay, so verse 6. <coughs> Pardon me. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locust and wild honey. Uh, there's a, um, apparently like an Instagram thing called Preachers and Sneakers, if you guys have heard of this. And I don't know if it's legit or not. I'm not going to spend my time trying to figure it out, to be honest. But it makes it look like some of these really well-known preachers, big churches and stuff like that, are wearing like $1,000 shoes and $700 t-shirts and stuff like that. And um, John's wearing camel's hair, <laughs> which is not like a Gucci product by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> you know, he's, he's not exactly clothed well. That's not happening. He's wearing poor and uncomfortable clothes. He's eating locusts and wild honey, which were kosher things that he could eat. In the wilderness, you couldn't just eat anything but locust was one of the acceptable things. And it was considered like easy food for the poor. Um, that was the idea. And wild honey means he's eating whatever he finds. Um, what's the point of giving us the description of John? John's like a prophet of old. John is like an Old Testament prophet. That's the idea. And we have even Old Testament passages that talk about the clothing that they would wear to help people identify who they were. And prophets who often called people to repentance would live a life that was like a, a a, uh, example of that repentance. So John here, eating the lesser foods and wearing the uncomfortable clothing is like showing humility, showing repentance, showing mourning. We also find that John taught his disciples to fast often, but Jesus, they didn't fast while they were with Jesus. See, because John is saying repent, and Jesus is saying it is done. You know, um, you clothe yourself in, in sackcloth, and he's saying now enter in. That's the idea. I think that's going on there. <clears throat> so, um, he seems to be calling people back out to the wilderness, which is interesting. Wilderness is a really interesting concept in the Old Testament. They were called into the wilderness when they left Egypt. They didn't get to leave the wilderness because of their unbelief. And then when they did leave, they crossed the Jordan River to enter back into the land. And he calls people back into the wilderness and has them go back into the Jordan River. And so there may be some symbolism here about them entering into God's promises. Right? Coming with repentant attitudes in faith and entering into the promises, the new thing God is doing with Christ. That may well be part of it there. Verse 7, it says, And he was preaching and saying, After me is one coming, uh, one is coming, one, the one, <clears throat> is coming, who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This passage, when he's talking here about Jesus, is to tell us a couple things. One, John's whole ministry pointed to Jesus. That was the main purpose of the ministry. But also um, to show the degree of worthiness. John is considered pretty, pretty worthy, not, I mean, in a human sense. None of us are worthy of salvation, but he's considered a very lofty individual as far as people go because Jesus said that he was like the greatest of, of those born among, uh, among women. He was like this final prophet, this final Old Testament prophet is basically who John is. But he says about himself that he's not even fit to take off Jesus' sandals. This was a, a job that it said was reserved for if you were in a Jewish household and you had Jewish servants and Gentile servants. They wouldn't even let the Jewish servants take your sandals off. Like that wasn't even allowed. Only let the Gentile servant do that. So we're talking like lowest of the low jobs as far as taking off someone's sandals. And he goes, I'm not even worthy to do that to Jesus which is, by the way, true, right? So John has some revelation about Christ that he understands and he's preaching people about. I, I do wish we had, like, more information about what John taught, like like a whole one of his sermons or something like that. Wouldn't it just be neat to just, like, read it? I think I'd be, I'd be stoked. Um, but what we have is him pointing to Christ. 
I think that John is not trying to diminish himself. He's not trying to say, I'm nothing, I'm a worm. Um, he, he's, he sees he has a calling. He knows that he has a mission in the name of God that he has to accomplish. So he's not devaluing himself. What, he, what he's doing is he's rightly valuing God. He's rightly valuing Christ. And I think a lot of our self-esteem stuff, what we sometimes do in our modern culture is we don't so much um, puff ourselves Part of it maybe is we puff ourselves up beyond what is, what is right. But another part is we just devalue God. It's all about me. Like, forget God and his desires and his wants and what his plans are. Like, don't let anybody step on you. Don't let anybody take advantage of you. Don't let anybody do what Jesus let them do to him when he said, follow him and love your enemies. Wait a minute. None of this works with Christian theology, this kind of like self-esteem, um, self-love. You know, just cut people out of your life. If they don't make you feel good and make you happy, cut them out of your life. Like, this is like... That's like straight from Satan. <laughs> that, that, that advice is, not, is so the opposite. Like, what if God did this to you just for five seconds, right? He's like, you know what? You guys aren't really bringing value into my life. You're gone, you know? Like, yeah, we're called to love like he loves. So um, anyways, John isn't, I don't think, devaluing himself. He sees himself clearly, but he sees God's glory clearly. And by comparison, we're all not worthy. We're all not worthy. And that gives us humility and proper worship. So John, he points people to and prepares them for Jesus by showing their sin, by calling them to repent. And he called them out. We'll read a little bit later. He actually, like some of the things he said, he just straight calls people out. He calls them things like brood of vipers. Like in Evangelism 101, no one ever told me to go around calling people broods of vipers. But there may be a time for this. But let it not come from your, e your ego, your wounded angry ego. Oh, you don't like, you want to take my tract? I'm going to yell at you for it. Like rather it was led by the Lord to call them out and call things as they truly were. And they did. Um, and he did, excuse me. Um, so he tells them also though, he doesn't leave them there. He tells them of forgiveness, free forgiveness. He baptizes them and he tells them that Jesus is the one and shows them that Jesus is greater than him. He's going to do something that John could never do. In fact, as he does, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus in particular, um, the difference between what Jesus will do and John, the one difference he gives, he says, I baptize you with water, he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit, which I think is referring to the indwelling of the Spirit, that new relationship we have with God that is accomplished through the cross. We don't see the, we do see instances in the Old Testament of people, how the Holy Spirit comes upon them, right? We, we see that in several individuals throughout the Old Testament, but we don't see this sort of constant indwelling experience of the Holy Spirit. That comes as a result of uh, the cross after the death and resurrection of Christ. And he says, be filled. And now we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I think that's what he's speaking of, that baptism. Um, my opinion there. Some people would disagree. So this, um, this isn't just John's message. What's interesting is everything John just did and everything he says are things that the Old Testament has been saying about Jesus all along. And that's why I think Mark starts with the Old Testament because none of it's new. John's message in a nutshell, right, is you have sin and you need to repent. Well, that's the law. That's the law. John says you need to uh, repent, be baptized, and this, this symbolizes, the symbolism we find out later comes through Jesus' death and his resurrection. So you need to believe in this cleansing that's not entirely clear, but one who will come, who will accomplish it for us, and that's where we get the third thing. Someone's coming. He's greater than I. He's going to do these things. And that's the entire Old Testament pointing us to the one, to this expectation, this expectation. Um, so yes, really neat stuff. Um, Matthew eleven thirteen. Jesus puts it this way. And I, I'm going to read into it a little bit. I fully admit this is what I think is implied in it. Matthew eleven thirteen, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Now, Jesus is saying the law and the prophets, they all prophesied until John. I think this includes John in the group of the law and the prophets. That's what it seems to be doing. So it seems to be saying that John is part of the law and the prophets prophesying. I think John is the culmination of it. And he's the one who could finally say, ah, all that stuff the law and prophets have been saying, here he is. He's Jesus. Here we have this in Mark. This is what we call a high Christology, right? Deep, thoughtful theology about um, who Jesus is and what he came to do. And it's in, the, in the, what most scholars consider the earliest of the Gospels. This is the apologetics moment we'll have right now. 
There are those who will think that the doctrines of who Jesus is develop slowly over time, and each gospel is, introduces new doctrines. Oh, it gets deeper. Oh, Jesus gets more deified as you go, or something like that. And um, this works really well if you don't know the gospels well. And people tell you that that's what it is, but that's not the case. This is deep, neat Christology stuff right in the very beginning. So we're going to go back over now. <clears throat> that's the main overview of Mark 1, 1 through 8. I hope this teaching method is helpful for you guys. We're going to go back over one more time. It's the first time I've done quite this. And we're just going to look at details we may have missed, but if I had shared them all, you might have lost the flow. So, verse 1. In the, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is called a couple things here. He is called the Christ, and he's called the Son of God. Just a reminder, Christ is not a last name. Christ is a word that has incredible depth of meaning. It's the, the equivalent is the Hebrew word Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, right? Or Messiah, right? He's the Messiah, however you want to pronounce that. The word itself means anointed one, anointed one, the one who is anointed, but that's just the etymology of a word, or it's just, you know, taking the parts of a word and saying, what does this part mean? What does that part mean? So it means anointed one. But it's more than its etymology. It's a weighty title. Basically, there's this guy that the Old Testament creates expectation for, starting in the Garden of Eden, and building expectation throughout all the historical books, through the Psalms, through the prophets. Incredible expectation for, and this guy is the Messiah. And this is even the term modern non-Christian Jews will use for this guy. The Messiah. The Messiah. In the 13 articles of faith for like Orthodox Jewish faith, one of them is that you need to believe in the Messiah and wait for his coming. That's a heavy, heavy title. Jesus is the Messiah. If you aren't aware of this, if anybody's not, I encourage you to check out the Jesus in the Old Testament series that we did. Um, it's like 21 videos, I think, 21 teachings on the topic, and you will know a whole lot about the one who was to come if you go through that Jesus in the Old Testament series. Jesus put it this way, though, John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And then he dropped the mic. <laughs> There's a lot of mic drop moments for Jesus, actually. You could just like draw a little microphone falling onto the ground, like in your Bible. Right? That would be, oh, boom. Um, so what I just encourage you to do is train yourself. Train yourself that Christ is not just a name. Every time you read the word Christ in the Bible, you think of a flood of Old Testament expectation and prediction of Jesus. Every time you see Christ, you just think, boom, and let your brain explode all over again about how radically powerful it is that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. It'll change how you read the New Testament. So the second title is he's the Son of God in Mark 1, this, verse 1. The Son of God. There is a depth of meaning here that deserves a whole Bible study on just the term Son of God, and we can go through all the usages of the Old Testament Son of God and its varied uses. Um, but I think the main focus, I'll just mention real quick, could be um, that Jesus' identity is having a unique relationship with God. Unique relationship with God. And this is consistent, especially in the Gospel of John, um, we especially see Jesus' unique relationship with the Father in these lots of passages where he describes himself and his relationship with the Father, which kind of forces the doctrine of the Trinity upon us. Right? One God with yet three persons. This, the Son is God, yet the Son is not the Father. And there's this, this really intricate stuff that happens there. In Hebrews 1, it shows us even more about Jesus' unique relationship with God. Um, let me just read to you the first few verses of Hebrews 1. It says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. So already we're, we're getting, um, the son is not like the prophets. He's unique among, among beings. Whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So he's at the creation, he's there. And at the inheritance, at the end, he's there. And he is the radiance of his glory. That's like saying he's like the light of the light. The shining of the light of God, you know. He's the radiance of God's glory. Can you imagine saying this about a human? Steve is the radiance of... No, it doesn't work. Sorry, Steve. I love you, brother. It does not work. It doesn't work for any of us. Yes. 
It's, it, see, it's just, you can't even joke because it's just blasphemous. Jesus is the radiance of his glory. And in case that bothered someone who didn't have the deity of Christ firmly planted in their mind, he is the exact representation of God's nature. What you can say is true about God's nature is true about Jesus' nature. Whatever is true about God's nature is true about Jesus' nature. When he had made purification, oh, excuse me, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. Steve, do you uphold all the, I mean, wow. When he had made purification for, of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he in, has inherited a more excellent name than they. So he had this initial glory. He comes down. He lowers himself lesser, lower than the angels for a time, accomplishes salvation, and then is exalted back to his right position, the right hand of God. Now, if you keep reading Hebrews 1, you'll see in verse 10 that it indicates Jesus is Yahweh. Yeah, that's for your own Bible study. I've talked about that before, so I'll just, I just want to throw it out there because it's like, it's a freebie. But this phrase, Son of God, we get a few times in the Gospel of Mark, and it seems to be related to this idea of the, ident idea of the identity of Jesus Christ in a special relationship with the Father. And so I'll quote a couple of places that later on will come up. So Mark 3.11 it says, whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, you are the son of God. Not even a, uh, but the son of God. He's not just like an angel or something, right? He's the son of God. So they're recognizing with their spiritual knowledge, here's the one, right? He's the son of God. Mark 14, 61. This is interesting because it's Caiaphas. It's the high priest. <clears throat> He's questioning Jesus. And he says to them, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Are you the son of the blessed? Not wanting to say God's name. He says the blessed. So this, the Christ here is interesting because here we have a, a, rec a record of the Jewish high priest who thought that the, the Messiah was also going to be the son of God. Are you the Messiah, the son of God? That these two things are similar, these two things are connected? That's an interesting idea. And then in Mark 15, 39, we have the final affirmation of a centurion who's standing there before Jesus when he's crucified and he dies. And it says, when the centurion who was standing in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. So we have um, affirmations. Jesus also in Mark 14, he affirms what the high priest asks. He's, he's going to affirm that as well. So we have it from Christ, from demons, from the centurion. We have it from the beginning of the gospel of Mark. There's a lot more about the son of God, but these are powerful titles. They refer to Jesus as fulfilling prophecy. And I think being the second person of the Trinity, I think we can safely say that. There's a lot more in the term son of God um, maybe for some other time. So there's something you might want to know about the word gospel. You already know what it means, right? The etymology, good news, good news. It's euangelion, euangelion. We get our word evangelize from it. I'm going to go evangelize. I'm going to go euangelionzo or whatever the verb form for, <laughs> for that one is. <laughs> Odzo is potential. I don't know. I didn't look it up. Somebody, somebody who knows Greek is just like frustrated right now with me. Anyways, it means good news, right? Overall, it is a simple and beautiful summary of the revelation of Jesus. Isn't it so cool that this whole gospel message, we summarize it by going, it's good news. I like good news. I like good news. Once I went to an outreach where the, the preacher, I think it was John Corson who got up, and he got up, and he, he, you know, he just smiles and laughs at his own jokes, and then we all laugh at his laugh, like, <laughs> like sometimes you guys do to me. Um, but anyways, he gets up there, and he goes, I have good news, you know, and he's, he's just the most sincere guy. It was great. Um, yeah, we have good news. We have good news. The gospel is not just something to be defended. It is something to be proclaimed. I mean, it is good news. The news of your forgiveness, that's some pretty stinking good news. God reconciling the world to himself, right? But this word gospel or euangelion, it had other uses. It's not, it's not like they invented a new word when they were writing the Bible here, right? They're using a word that's used in other ways. One of those uses, as it has multiple ones, like any word does, one of them had a particular usage relating to the arrival of a king. This was used in Jewish and Roman contexts. If there was a king coming, they would always send a herald ahead, and the herald may proclaim the euangelion that the king is about to arrive. The good news that the king is on his way. 
So the herald would come. I mean, the kings didn't just show up unannounced. They wanted to have a reception when they came. You know, like if the president just walked in the room right now, right, that, that's just not how it's normally done. They're normally going to, well, of course, have a bunch of Secret Service people check us all out or whatever. But, you know, they're going to they're gonna have like a procession of some kind that goes on, typically speaking. And so they would proclaim the coming of a king. And we have actually examples of this in the scripture. And it's almost like a little bit of a swipe at the kings of the world when Mark's like, here's the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the, the king, the son of God. And here he is. He's arriving. So how is the king coming? How is he heralded? Well, that's in verses 2 and 3 as we go through our final time through. You're going to memorize it by the time we're done. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. So that's the heralding. That's the coming of the king. Um, <clears throat> this proclaimed in the words of Old Testament prophecy. It says Isaiah. So we're going to look at these passages. And the first thing you notice when you look at them is one's from Isaiah 40 verse 3. That's, that's verse 3 in this passage. And the other is from Malachi 3.1. That's verse 2. Now, here's where some will, will say Mark was just such a dummy, he didn't know that one of the things he quoted came from Malachi. And here's where you kind of have to pause and just say, for those of us who are studying the Bible and you come across something, you're like, wait, that doesn't make sense. It helps if you don't assume the authors are fools. Right? Like if there's a passage where a guy says, like in Proverbs, answer a fool according to his folly. The next verse, don't answer a fool according to his folly. Do you really think the, the author is so dim-witted that he's contradicting himself and not realizing it from one verse to the next? Or do you think he's making a point, right? Like when you say it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. If you just give a little bit of credit to the guy that wrote the thing, you'll realize he's making a point. And so it's the same kind of thing here. Um, actually, this is a known thing where you would quote two passages from the Old Testament, and you would, um, you would give the name of only one of the prophets, maybe the more better known prophet, in this case, Isaiah over Malachi. So when it says in Isaiah, and he quotes two passages, but what he's doing when he brings the two passages together is he's connecting them. So as you're studying them, you can see there's messianic context for both of these passages. They are talking about the same thing. Um, that's what you're getting in Malachi 3.1 and in Isaiah 43. Um, so both passages, though, as you look at them in context, this is exciting as I'm studying, just reminding myself of these things. Malachi 3.1, Isaiah 40, verse 3. Again, it is not just the Messiah that shows up in these passages. It is God, Yahweh, who shows up in these passages. It's him. God is coming to visit his people, Israel. God will show up. That's the context. Those are the verses that he chooses to quote. Um, so... Um, uh, I could do a whole study on just the context of Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 43, but that, that'll be for you to study it. it. It would literally be, we'll spend the whole day just looking at Isaiah and Messianic stuff, which we should do tomorrow, actually. Okay, verse 4. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for, sin, uh, for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, now, John the Baptist is somewhat of a controversial figure, or at least to some people he is. Um, side note, he was not part of the Baptists' movement. Um, actually, we have it translated Baptist, and most translators will keep to the tradition of translating it Baptist, but the word itself is baptizer. He was a guy doing baptisms, so he's called John the Baptizer. That's how he was known. There was lots of Johns. He was known as being John the Baptizer, so they would know who they were talking about, right? So he was a baptizer. He was well-known, though. He was well-respected, and we actually have in an um, ex extra-biblical source called Josephus, a first-century Jewish Roman historian. He was Jewish and Roman historian. And he wrote about John the Baptist, believe it or not, actually in, uh, in his works. And so he records these things, that John the Baptist was a real guy. He was well-known and had a very big following in Israel. He records that uh, John commanded Jews to exercise virtue and do righteousness and have piety toward God. He's calling people towards right living and that John administered baptisms in particular. Now, he goes on to interpret what John's baptism was all about, and he seems to be interpreting it. He seems to give his own Josephus spin that's more about like rabbinical Judaism that came after the destruction of the temple. I think that that's what he's doing, is he's, he's, trying, to put, he's trying to put a weird theology on John's baptism that we don't see in the earlier sources, which we have in, our, in, in the Bible here. It's interesting stuff what he puts there. But he also says that John was a controversial figure who was killed by Herod. 
which is also what our New Testament tells us. Um, so what was John's baptism about? Well, I, I went to uh, Israel. I, I've been there twice. Um, fantastic trip to take and really neat stuff to do. And uh, a few days into the trip, you just get information overload. At first, you're taking all these notes. You're recording videos everywhere. And then after a while, you're just trying to get on the bus before it drives away, you know? Um, and you're dragging your feet. And you're like, oh, uh, too much information. I don't know. I, I went to a place called Masala. I don't know. What was it? No. Um, that's Indian food. I'm just making it. I'm just, I'm just, I'm telling jokes for myself even. It's not even for anybody else at this point. But we did this Israel trip, and we go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, like, discovery area, which is the Dead Sea, right? I bet you could have guessed that one. So we go to the Dead Sea, and we're there, and they bring us into a room where they're doing excavations in this area of a group called the Essenes. How many of you guys have heard of the Essenes? Yeah, okay, so the Essenes were this, like, weird, secluded group of sort of end times Jews. They believed the end was coming. And among other things, they wrote down and copied lots of texts, including the Bible, including and Old Testament, including other things. And they stored these in scrolls and put them in caves. And we discovered those in the 1900s called the Dead Sea Scrolls, gave us our oldest copies of the Old Testament that we've ever found by a thousand years. It was like huge discovery, radical discovery, neat stuff. But these Essenes were kind of a weird community. They, um, they believed that you were not supposed to get married or have kids. Or at least definitely didn't have kids. I'm assuming they thought you weren't supposed to get married. I'm not sure what the point would be. If you're like, if you're, if you know, anyway, you get what I'm saying. But, um, but yeah, so they were like this weird, no wonder why they died out, right? Their whole community is not having kids. Like, you realize this isn't going to work. Like, this is not going to be a good doctrine to hold to. But I go to the Dead Sea Scrolls area, and they play this videotape for our, our tour party. And this videotape is talking about the Essenes and John the Baptist. And it's saying, John the Baptist, it appears as though he was an Essene. And I'm like, that's obscene. I mean, like, he, was not, he was not this weird group. Like, I mean, read your Bible. Like, this isn't what John the Baptist was about. And um, so it's a popular internet thing to think this. And they play it to people, to tour groups who go through. And I remember afterwards, I gathered my tour group. I was like, right, guys, I, here's the differences between John the Baptist and the Essenes. And I'll give you some of those today. <clears throat> For instance, the Essenes, what, one thing they have, why people think, well, maybe it connected to John, is they had ritual baths, lots of them. They would take baths all the time. Not like baths, like bubble bath, kind of, right? They just go in the water, come out of the water. Ritual cleansing all the time, probably many times a day that they would be doing these things. And because of that, they're like, John the Baptist? Essenes did a lot of baptismals? Baptismalizing, or whatever the word is. And, yeah, so that's, that's the connection. Okay, so here's some of the differences. Um, John, for one thing, he seems unconnected to any community. We don't see him as part of a community. He's out in the wilderness. He's not part of an Essene group down here in the Dead Sea area, but they're up in the Jordan, further north from at least where the Essene community was. The Essene community had baths. He's baptizing people where? In the Jordan. He's not even using their baths. How is he part of their group when he's doing something different than them? That doesn't really click. But people get excited about things that undermine our understanding of Scripture. And they push these things because they don't realize they also have a bias. Um, the, uh, um, Josephus, he mentions John, but says nothing about any community that, J that John was connected to, the Essenes or anything like that. Um, let's see. Essene baptism was repeated, ritual washing, and it was self-administered. John's baptism, which was about physical impurity, John's baptism was a one-time event about repentance and forgiveness of sins. These are just totally different kinds of things, and it was not self-administered. You needed him to baptize you. That was the idea. The Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary puts it this way. And by the way, the phrase scholarly consensus is not something you want to throw out willy-nilly. It's a big deal. It says, a scholarly consensus holds that John did not take over or adopt any particular baptism from his milieu. Milieu. I always like using that word. Milieu. Fun word. Okay, so you will hear this stuff online. You will see this stuff shared, but it's not grounded on anything. Um, John was not likely in a scene or connected to their community at all, or if he had at some point been, he seems to have completely changed by the time he is there showing up doing his stuff, which means we have no reason to think he's connected to that kind of group. Um, still, I'm glad the Essenes were there. I'm glad that we have all the writings from the Dead Sea Scrolls. But, uh, but yeah. Okay, verse 5, as we do our 
extra stuff, bonus time. <clears throat> and all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. This phrase, all the country and all of Jerusalem, I've heard people attack the Bible here as well. Every single person in the country went down to John. All of Jerusalem, every human being in Jerusalem went down to John to be baptized. And here's where I just want to say, and I've heard it used, it's a phrase, all means all and that's all all means. That's not accurate. We do this all the time where we use the word all to not mean all, right? We, we, we all know what we mean, and it's the same thing here, right? All the country of Judea means a lot of people, and of course, Josephus confirms this as well as what Mark says. So here we have extra biblical confirmation of the fact of that. Um, this is just normal way of talking. Um, so let's look, though. I thought it would be fun to look at John's preaching. In Luke chapter 3, let me check how I'm doing on time here. All right, we're okay. The study's like an hour and a half, right, typically? I'm joking. <clears throat> I'm joking. Look, I, I don't even have, like, it's the last page. All right. <laughs> Luke chapter 3, verse 7, we get an actual sample of John's preaching, which I thought would be really good to actually hear the kinds of things he instructed people. So Luke 3, verse 7. It says, So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, Welcome, oh, greatly loved of God. <laughs> no. Um, now, he probably said more than this. This is a summary, but this is one of the main points he would have taught them. He says, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. So, can you imagine the comments on John's YouTube videos? <laughs> He's doing this. Or what, the, or what would happen at the board meeting at his church after he taught that on Sunday morning? I'm not saying we can willy-nilly go out and just scream and be mad and angry preachers. That's not at all what I'm saying. But I am saying that our hypersensitivity to offending people does sometimes rob us of truth. And John seemed to not care. Um, of course, he didn't have a board or anybody to... He was just eating locusts and honey anyway, so... <laughs> it wasn't really work. Yeah, what are you going to do, man? <laughs> what are you going to do, chase me out <laughs> into the wilderness? Like, what are you going to do? Anyway, so he says, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance. See, repentance is the turning of the heart. The, the change of life is the result of repentance. And he goes, come on, show me that you mean it. Show me that you mean it. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. So the idea is that to the Jewish audience, we have our heritage. We are born you know, sort of chosen and selected. And I was raised in the church and I've been going my whole life kind of as the modern day parallel to this. And the idea is it's like, no, show me that your life is living for Christ. Show me that you live for him. And not just that you have a heritage of people in the past who did. You know, show me that you're really doing it. Then in verse nine, he says, indeed, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. And this is why he's so vigorous in his preaching. He realizes judgment will fall upon Israel if they don't turn to God. There's like a, a season for them. And when they didn't largely come to Christ, it was 40 years later in the destruction of the temple. And a judgment did fall. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were questioning him, saying, then what shall we do? And that is a beautiful response. John, I'm really offended by you. You know, you might be right, but you're rude. Right? He didn't, none of that. They're just like, what do we do? What do we do? What do I need to do? Right? What do I have to do? And here's his response. And it's really great. And he would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. It's so crazy. He's like, you're brood of vipers. And like, what do we do? He's like, you know, help people. Be nice. Get better than be nice. Find someone who doesn't have what you have and give some of what you have to them. Help him out. He's just talking about brotherhood. You know, just like human brotherhood, loving people, taking care of each other. And some of the tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, teacher, what shall we do? So what does he tell tax collectors? He doesn't even say, quit your job. He just says, and he said to them, collect no more than what you have been ordered to. No abuse of your power. Integrity. Right? Just integrity. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said, to them, 
Do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. He's dealing with corruption in government power. See, a Christian in government should be like the most trustworthy. I feel like a, a government of almost any design should run well if real Christians are involved in it, you know, in all aspects. Like, because any design government, the, the, the downfall is always corruption. The downfall is always the corruption and the sin of man that gets in there and messes those things up. And so it's almost like in America, we, they've tried to make a government that was like more corruption proof than the ones they had experienced before. That was the idea, I think, behind it. I'm not a, I'm not a political science guy, so forgive me if I got that completely wrong, but that was my thought. Um, but at any rate, he's just saying, hey, turn to God and let it change your life. And the application for us is pretty simple, isn't it? Following Jesus means what for you? What are you? Are you a tax collector? Are you a centurion? Right? Are, are you the person with the two tunics? Like, what does it mean for you? Go do that. Do that. Do that. You don't need, you don't need someone standing over your shoulder to tell you. It's not just read, read the Bible and pray. It is that. I mean, read the Bible and pray. This is not a cliche. This is like essential spiritual growth stuff, right? But it's also just like, hey, put your wife's needs before yours for once. Come on. Or how about for always? You know, um, how about in, when you go to the room, find out how someone else is doing before you tell them how you're doing. You know? <laughs> like simple, simple obedience stuff. Then we get towards the end here and we're going to finish up. John, uh, verse 6, John was clothed with camel's hair, back in Mark 1, and wore a leather belt around his waist and his diet was locusts and wild honey and he was preaching and saying, after me one is coming who is mightier than I and I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, he's mightier, but still John was pretty important. Um, uh, what I want to do, though, is this. I want to close by just bringing you to John chapter 5. So if you go to John 5, and we'll see some of the stuff we just saw in Mark 1. Remember, Mark 1 doesn't just say, here's John, there's Jesus. He says, here's the Old Testament prophesying John and Jesus. Here's John, here's Jesus. You, you get there's, it's deeper than that, it's bigger than that. And when you add that element of prophecy, it's just like, man can't do that. Um, and we see God's divine hand in it. But here we have in John 5, this passage where we're going to read it, um, looking specifically for what evidence does Jesus give to prove who he is? Just like Mark gives Old Testament prophecy and then gives the proclamation of John as evidence for Jesus. That's what he's doing in chapter 1. Here we have in John 5, Jesus himself talking about evidence for Jesus. He'll give three different evidences for Jesus, for, his, for the genuineness of who he is. John 5.31 if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Right? On, on Song Hong, or one of the two or three guys in Mexico right now pretending that they're Jesus. You alone come and just show up and say you're Jesus? Guess what? You're not. You're not. So how do we know Jesus was the real one? Verse 32, there is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. Well, who's this other? Verse 33, you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. Jesus didn't know, need John to tell him who he was. The Jews of the first century needed John to tell him who Jesus was, that he'd be the forerunner to proclaim. Verse 35, let's look at the second witness. Um, well, I guess we're still looking at John here. Uh, he was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. So Jesus' second piece of evidence, which he says is better than John, is the miracles he's doing. And I would say the biggest miracle evidence he offered, we all know what it was. It was his death and resurrection, which is crazy that there is such a great case we can make historically for the resurrection even today. God has just saw fit to organize reality in such a way that this great work, speaking of the truth of Christ, would be able to speak to all generations. I think that's, uh, that makes me smile. All right, third piece of evidence, verse 37. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. So he had John, he had the works, and now he has the Father. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify, these that testify about me. So Jesus gave three witnesses. He says, I have John, but I got something even better. I got 
um, my miracles and my works, my death and resurrection, right? That's the sign of Jonah. And then he says, and I have the Father himself through the prophecy of the Old Testament telling you about me. And so it's like I look at these and I go, Jesus is giving thoughtful, evidential case for the truthfulness of who he is. And it's right there in the scriptures all along. All along. Neat stuff. We're going to see all three of these witnesses uh, as we go through the Gospel of Mark. We'll see them kind of coming out. But next week, actually it's two weeks because next week's Mother's Day and we're going to be kind of a family day for most of us. So we won't be here next week. But in two weeks, we're going to talk about Jesus' baptism and probably his temptation in the wilderness. Those two really interesting Really interesting theologically, all the stuff that we get from those things. Um, so we're going to look at those major things. So I hope you guys are enjoying this. I'm loving, I'm, I'm so excited about the Gospel of Mark and getting to do this. I mean, people were like, why are you doing Mark? And I was like, that's why. <laughs> right there, that's why. So let's pray. Um, Father God, we just thank you for the glory that is in the Gospel of Mark and that we get to just continue to learn and grow from it. We pray that we would be sharpened we'd be strengthened, we'd be, we'd be equipped, and, Lord, that we would have application of these simple truths to our lives. Help us to look at our life this week uh, and just be thinking about how we can do that simple, practical obedience to Christ with um, whatever our responsibilities are, with whatever our calling is, and uh, with the needs of people around us when we have more and they don't. In Jesus' name, amen.